the world over today, hundreds of millions of people are besieged by anxiety about their present and future security, dignity, and prospects of well-being. Many are victims and witnesses of present assaults of many, and many more are afraid of future violations of their most fundamental expectations. In his opening address, our Secretary General provided a graphic snapshot of the condition of the world and humanity, a situation that calls into question the state of multilateralism in terms of its founding aspirations as well as its present agenda. The poverty, fear, suffering, and humanitarian distress haunting the victims of conflict, drought, famine, flooding, wildfires, cyclones, deadly disease outbreaks, and other disasters are the outcomes of sustained violation of the most essential principles and the systemic neglect of humanity's dearest values, which lie at the very foundation of the UN Charter. The failure of peace and security systems, inadequate development and limited climate action, amidst technological advancement and enormous wealth has left us in a state of paralysis and during one of the darkest periods of human existence. We may all agree, without any fear of contradiction, that the world is headed in a most undesirable direction. It is moments like this that the affirmative spirit of multilateralism, international collective action, and global solidarity is most needed and should be attained. This is not the occasion for any member of the United Nations to escape when they should be rising to the challenge of the moment. Resorting to pursuit of narrow, insular, antisocial agendas within exclusive clubs constituted to maintain the status quo that undermines and cannibalizes the United Nations systems at the expense of progress in humanity's collective journey to the future of our aspirations is totally unacceptable. The existence of this inimical clique of geopolitical formations defies the fundamental values and principles of the UN system and its operations have led to alienation, mistrust, insecurity, and exclusion of and among peoples, nations, regions, and continents. Moments like now place the nature and purpose of multilateralism under sharp scrutiny for history's honest examination and judgment. If any confirmation was ever needed that the United Nations Security Council is dysfunctional, undemocratic, non-inclusive, unrepresentative, and therefore incapable of delivering meaningful progress in our world as presently constituted, the rampant impunity of its actors on global scene settles that matter. The environment of pervasive mistrust between the global north versus the global south, developed versus developing, rich versus poor, polluters versus victims, and net emitters versus net victims, which complicate and frustrates multilateralism is the inevitable result of promises not kept, commitments not actualized, resolutions not honored, and principles not observed. Multilateralism has been failed by abuse of trust, negligence, and impunity. A year ago, I stood in this assembly hall to call upon the global community to transform the UN system in order to achieve a consensus-driven, rules-based multilateral system which works for the people of the world in their diversity. It is time 
for multilateralism to reflect the voice of the farmers, represent the hopes of villagers, champion the aspirations of pastoralists, defend the rights of fisherfolk, express the dreams of traders, respect the wishes of workers, and indeed protect the welfare of all peoples of the world. In the face of the most urgent crisis of our time, it is now clear that the international community has fallen seriously behind in meeting its targets in both climate action and the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, as well as their underlying enabler, peace and security. We as Africa have come to the world not to ask for arms, charity, or handouts, but to work with the rest of the global community to give every human being in this world a decent chance of security and prosperity by taking necessary actions, mobilizing adequate resources for investment, confronting security challenges, and resolving conflict as we all make our contribution to global prosperity. Kenya is proud of the contribution it, has con it continues to make in its tireless endeavor to support peacemaking, conflict uh, prevention, peacekeeping, peace building, and other interventions undertaken across different regions. All across Africa, there is progress in efforts to resolve conflict and restore peace and stability, while at the same time, we are witnessing setbacks to democratic consolidation in the form of unconstitutional changes to governments. Kenya remains committed, determined, and indefatigable in its contribution to unity, peace, security, stability, and prosperity. Often, we have made encouraging progress. For example, on 5th December 2022, the Juba peace agreement ushering in a two-year transition was signed by the parties to the conflict in Sudan. A day after, the inter-Congolese dialogue on ESC-led process and concluded its third session in Nairobi. The following day, the government of Somalia and Somaliland agreed to resume reconciliation. We are also proud of the progress made in stabilizing Eastern DRC as a result of the EAC regional force setting the DRC on the path to sustainable peace and stability. In Ethiopia, the guns have gone silent following the Pretoria and Nairobi agreements, while in South Sudan, the parties have committed to explore ways to resume and conclude the stalled peace process and to hold elections. Our proactive commitment to peace, which is not limited to our continent, inspired us to dispatch the African peace delegation consisting of six African heads of state to Moscow and Kiev with a 10-point peace plan, beginning with efforts to initiate a mediation process to resolve the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Although the delegation encountered significant challenges in their mission, we remain very proud that they showed up. The hunger for peace and security in Africa is evident, and this bodes well for the prospects of attaining the Africa Union's Agenda 2063 and global peace. Kenya stands in solidarity with all humanity without regard to region, border, or hemisphere. This is why and how we see the people of the Republic of Haiti who are suffering immensely from the bitter legacy of slavery, colonialism, sabotage, and neglect. As a nation which was forced to wage a painful struggle for our own independence and sovereignty, Kenya empathizes very deeply with the humiliation of our proud people in Haiti and the price they have had to pay for their hunger for liberty and the sorrow they have endured for their thirst for freedom. Haiti is the ultimate test of international solidarity and collective action. The international community has failed this test so far and thus let down 
our people very, very badly. Haiti deserves better from the world. The cry of our brothers and sisters who were the first people to win their struggle for freedom from colonial tyranny has reached our ears and touched our hearts. Doing nothing in the face of the historic isolation, neglect, and betrayal of the people of Haiti is out of question. Inaction is no longer an option. As we mobilize to show up for Ukraine and countries that have experienced the devastating impact of climate shocks, including Libya, Morocco, and Hawaii, we must not leave Haiti behind. We must commit to show up in the spirit of solidarity to support a people regain their political and socio-economic footing by reinforcing the underlying enabler that is security. Kenya is ready to play its part in full and join with a coalition of other nations of goodwill, and there are many, as a great friend and true sibling of Haiti. We urge the United Nations to urgently deliver an appropriate framework to facilitate the deployment of multinational security support as part of a holistic response to Haiti's challenges. We call on the Security Council to contribute positively by approving a resolution under Chapter 7 that tailors the security support mission to the specific needs of Haiti and its people. We should be part this should be part of a comprehensive strategy that includes delivering humanitarian aid, supporting livelihoods, instituting reforms, and fostering a political process guided and owned by Haitians, all in the aim of enabling free and fair elections within a reasonable time frame. We are encouraged by many countries which have already stepped forward to take part in this solidarity. We must recognize that stability, peace, and security form the foundation on which the pursuit and realization of sustainable development and climate action stands. This realization must enable us to formulate strategies which treat these initiatives as interconnected, mutually reinforcing, and complementary dimensions of a single agenda. The tragic spectacle of young people from Africa boarding rickety contraptions to gamble their lives away on dangerous voyages in pursuit of opportunities abroad, either as conflict, climate, or economic refugees, is a statement of the failure of the global economic system. At the, recent, at the recently concluded Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi, we undertook to begin the journey to course correct and execute a paradigm shift in our pursuit for development and climate action. First, we recognize that both climate action and sustainable development goals must be pursued simultaneously with greater resolve, urgency, and ambition. No meaningful development can take place in countries that are also struggling with climate shocks, and yet, at the same time, the frequency of climate emergencies impedes any meaningful development. As a defining outcome of the Africa Climate Summit, we committed Africa to consider the dual problems through an opportunity lens and deliver effective solutions by pursuing a fresh trajectory. Development is a basic necessity for every society. It must happen one way or another. There should be no doubt about that. Annually, 30 million young people in our continent need jobs, and many more need food. Half of our continent is in the dark without access to electricity in 2023, while hundreds of millions can only cook using biomass because they have no electricity. This is why the commitment of African nations in the Nairobi Declaration is both radical and transformative. Development, in our opinion, is a fundamental imperative, and green growth 
is the only sustainable way to achieve it. From our standpoint, there is no need to be trapped in a false choice. Sustainable development is robust climate action, and climate action is development. Africa's potential is defined by abundant and diverse resources, ranging from a youthful, highly skilled, and motivated young population, immense renewable energy potential, and mineral resources, including critical minerals and extensive natural capital endowment, including 60% of the world's unutilized arable land. Capital and technology can find no better returns anywhere than the tremendous investment opportunity in Africa's potential. Such investment would drive green growth, creating jobs and wealth, while decarbonizing global production and consumption. Further, the investments would also connect over 600 people to clean electricity, provide clean cooking to about a billion people, finance green manufacturing, including e-mobility, transform African agriculture and food systems, including the manufacture of green fertilizer, process vast tonnage of steel, aluminum, and lithium required by new green industries, and enable our young people find the livelihoods they desire at home and reverse the tide of migration in the opposite direction. To unlock financing at scale and create incentives for investment at scale in green opportunities, the Nairobi Declaration makes the reform of the international financial system a priority. No meaningful climate action or development can take place in conditions of financial distress. According to IMF data, as of last month, 10 low-income countries were already in debt distress, and 52 are at high or moderate risk of falling into debt distress. The 3.3 billion people in these countries are trapped in a vicious circle of emergency responses, reconstruction, and recovery from more frequent climate shocks, which diverts resources away from both development and climate action, and sucking vulnerable countries into a downward spiral of debt and environmental stress. The global community must therefore develop a debt restructuring initiative that does not wait for nations to plunge over the cliff into debt distress before providing relief. Rather, the new sovereign debt architecture should extend the tenure of sovereign debt and provide a 10-year grace period for countries that are in debt distress. The second financing intervention relates to concessional financing. It is time to work with the international financial institutions to provide more concessional loans, approximately to the tune in our estimation of about $500 billion, billion and to provide increased liquidity support through special drawing rights with a minimum target of what was obtained during the COVID pandemic of 650 billion. Access should be based on specific needs, not entitlement. And this necessitates changes to the allocation mechanism different from what we saw during SDRs for COVID. The third critical reform is that of the financial market reorganization. The entire system of risk assessment and the opaque method methodologies employed by credit rating agencies and risk analysis needs to be overhauled at the minimum. We must all recall the miscalculation of subprime mortgage risks by these agencies two decades ago, 
which precipitated a financial crisis whose effects reverberate to date. And ask the following question. On what basis should we believe that their methodologies are better at assessing risk in faraway frontier markets like ours that are far much more complicated to measure objectively than in assessing the value of financial assets in the markets where they actually operate and which they got so disastrously wrong. If they got it wrong then, I bet you, they have it wrong now. In any case, any objective rating must also take into account principles of responsible sovereign lending and accounting, specifically emphasizing the need for international accounting systems that supports the proper valuation of mineral wealth, natural capital, and ecosystem services in the computation of national GDPs. Until that is done, very wealthy countries will be categorized as poor. The fourth limp of the inter in interventions arising out of the Nairobi Declaration is the establishment of a global public climate financing mechanism funded through a global carbon tax on trade in fossil fuels, as well as an emissions levy on aviation and maritime transport, including the option of a global financial transactions tax in order to make available dedicated, affordable, and accessible capital for green investments at scale. The roadmap to this new and urgently needed institutional infrastructure involves sustained engagement at various multilater multilateral processes and the instruments to actualize it by 2025 shall be a new global climate finance charter to be negotiated through the United Nations General Assembly, COP28, and associated processes. We understand the facts about our collective situation as a global community and as a member of the United Nations family. We know the magnitude of our shared challenges and common threats. We appreciate that multilateralism is on trial and our task is to defend it. We also recognize that multilateralism is broken and it is our responsibility to fix it. From this moment to 2030 and from our problems to their solutions, we are connected by a coherent agenda of robust collective action. We must therefore master the courage and will to stand together in solidarity and act, to right past wrongs, solve present problems, and secure our collective future to protect and empower all people and support our friends in need, to restore broken trust, raise hopes high, and keep faith strong, and finally, to pursue, achieve, and sustain positive change in order to make billions of cherished dreams come true. We must start right away, for we have no time to lose. And I thank you.